Welcome to this, the second instalment of a G482 overview. In this lecture, I will attempt to cover all of waves. So we'll be looking at everything to do with waves today. And uh, we'll get started off by looking at progressive waves. Progressive waves transfer energy. That's the whole point of waves. And they do so without any net transfer of matter. And they also do so by periodic oscillations. So a uh, wave causes something to oscillate and therefore it, trans it transmits the energy from one place to another. Um, when we come to look at the different types of waves, you'll have transverse and longitudinal. So with longitudinal, particularly um, here we're thinking of mechanical waves like sound, um, this point is important. There is matter may move in the direction the wave energy is travelling, but there's no net transfer of energy, uh, of matter, sorry. So there's no transfer of uh, air particles from here to here if a sound wave was travelling through there. The, sound, the air particles may well oscillate in the direction the wave energy is travelling, but they don't actually transfer from A to B. Let's have a look at the features of a wave, and uh, this is a graphical illustration of a wave here. Transverse illustrations are usually used because they're easier to produce and they're easier to understand as well. Now whenever you have a wave plotted on axes, you have on the x, oh, sorry on the y axis you have displacement x, but watch out for the x axis because it could be position or it could be time. So I'll bring up the time axis in a moment. Uh, now, displacement is measured from this, which is the equilibrium position. So along here, that's our equilibrium position. If there was no wave, all of the particles, if it was uh, transmitting the wave energy through particles, they would be along here. But they, uh, because this is a transverse wave, they're displaced in the vertical direction from that equilibrium position. So we've got displacement there. Now, displacement can be positive, but it can also be negative. So, and so this is the negative displacement. It also happens to be the amplitude because this is the maximum displacement. And when we think of amplitude and maximum displacement, we're just thinking of the magnitude, we're not thinking of the direction in particular, but displacement can be positive or negative, so make sure you appreciate that. Then we have the wavelength, and so wavelength is the distance between two consecutive points that are in phase. Two peaks are good candidates for two points that are in phase, nice and easy to identify. Or two troughs, they're also in phase. We'll look at what phase means later on. But for now, they're both doing exactly the same thing at the same time. So they're both at maximum positive displacement there. They're at the amplitude. So that's the wavelength. Now, as I said, watch out for the axes. Uh, position here. We're measuring distances, so that from there, that reason, this is the wavelength, it's the distance between two consecutive points. Also, when you're measuring the wavelength or the period, as we'll see in a moment, it's a good idea to measure several wavelengths and then divide by the number you measured. So measure five wavelengths and then divide by five or four, however many you've got, try to use a few. If we change the axis to time, then now, this is the time period. So these two points, they're in phase, but we're on the time axis, so therefore this would tell us the time, the difference between these two times there. Okay, uh, frequency is related to the period. Period, capital T. Frequency is one over the time period, and the unit for that is hertz. There are different types of waves that you can have. You can have waves on a string, you can have water waves, you can have electromagnetic waves, sound waves, seismic waves, so different types of wave, and when we come to look at interference, that's going to be important, an important consideration because only waves of the same type can interfere with each other. Okay, wave speed then. What we're going to do here is use the definitions of wavelength and the definition of frequency to determine uh, how you could work out wave speed. So we're going to derive the equation from wavelength and 
frequency. Frequency definition is the, it's the number of waves that pass a point per unit time. The wavelength is, tells us the length of the wave, it's the distance between two consecutive points. So here we're counting how many of those distances between the consecutive points pass a point per unit time. And this tells us the actual length there. So frequency times the wavelength will give us the total distance travelled per unit time. Because we know each one is a certain length. If we multiply uh, that certain length by how many pass the point, then we know how far the whole thing travelled in one unit time, in per unit time. So therefore, frequency times wavelength is the total distance, travel per unit time, and therefore V equals F lambda. This will illustrate this point. Here's my wave that's going to be moving past this point here, starting at trough. So you can count how many wavelengths pass that in, per, in one second, so that's the unit time. So after one second, this much of the wave has moved past that point, and there are one, two, three wavelengths that have moved, moved past that, so the uh, speed we could determine from that. So we, we do the number times the length of each one, then we would get the speed. Right, uh, there are different directions of vibration that you can have, so waves can be transverse or longitudinal. Uh, transverse waves, have, uh, their vibrations are perpendicular to the direction that the wave is travelling in. So if the wave was travelling left to right, then the vibrations would be in the vertical direction. So if these are our undisturbed particles there, and the wave is travelling through, then they're going to be forced to move this way. So that's why we get a wave shape like that. And uh, even, well, let's go on to longitudinal. It, with longitudinal waves, the oscillations, the vibrations here are parallel to the direction the wave is travelling. So if the wave is travelling left to right, the, os or the vibrations occur in that direction also. And these displacements are going to cause places where the particles are compressed and places where they're spread out. And so you have compressions and rarefactions. Those are the terms for that, those occurrences. So here we have a compression, the, the particles are being forced together, and here we have a rarefaction, and my compressions are lining up with peaks here in the transverse representation, and the rarefactions are lining up with the troughs. So compression is like a peak, and the, the rarefaction is like the trough. So, so Transverse representations are often used for longitudinal waves as well, just to represent the signal that the wave is transmitting, just because they're easier to work with. It's quite hard to, to actually do some work with those compressions, but so you can do some with it. And we'll also come to a phenomenon of transverse waves that gives us a way of determining whether a wave is transverse or longitudinal as well. Okay. Wave intensity. Now we said that uh, waves they transfer energy, so intensity is quite an important feature of a wave. It tells you how much wave energy is arriving per unit time per unit area. So that's what intensity is. So it's power over area because energy per unit time is power. And so intensity is P over A, and the units are therefore watts per square meter. Now, let's take a point source, and we're going to consider our point source of a wave, and wave energy is travelling out in all directions from the point source. What area will the energy cover at a certain distance? It's going to cover the surface area of a sphere around, centred on that point source. And the surface area of the sphere is 4 pi r squared. So I is P over 4 pi r squared. So let's have a look at what that would look like. There's our point source. The wave energy is travelling out in three, three dimensions around that point source. 
So the wave energy will travel out from there and it will cover a, the surface area of a sphere and it's centred on that point source. The distance from the point source to the point where you're considering will form the radius of that sphere. Okay? So you would be observing the wave here, taking measurements at that point. What you're interested in, how much energy is arriving per unit area, per unit time there. But some of the energy is spread out over here, so you're not receiving all of the energy. You're just receiving the part that arrives at that point there. Okay, uh, so therefore this R here is actually the distance away from the point source, therefore the radius of that sphere. So that's our equation, and now in this equation, P is a constant, 4 and pi are also constants. P here is the power at the source. And uh, that means that intensity is proportional to 1 over r squared here. Now that r is the distance away you are from the source. Now we often call that distance a d actually. So I can say i is proportional to 1 over d squared. So that's the relationship between intensity and the distance from a point source. And um, if you double, that means if you double the distance, the intensity will fall to a quarter of the initial value. And if you treble the distance, it will fall to a ninth, and if you quadruple it, it will follow, fall to one sixteenth of the initial value. Okay? So, here's the wave energy travelling from our point source, it covers a certain area at this distance, and then if we double the distance, it will cover four times the area, so therefore, the, the energy is more thinly spread and you would receive less energy per unit area. So the energy keeps spreading out. And if you went further, then it gets more thinly spread still. Let's put a graph of intensity with distance. And this is the kind of curve that you would get. This is the shape of an inverse square graph. And they come up quite often in physics, so it's well worth appreciating what's going on here. Okay, so we've got that very rapid fall off and then an asymptote here. So that's what the graph would look like. You can also plot uh, intensity against wavelength and get a spectrum. The intensity spectrum um, Yeah, because the waves that are emitted by your point source don't always have the same wavelength, and the, the energy uh, emitted at each wavelength is often different, so that's why you would often plot intensity against wavelength. And the graph would look like this. This is actually a typical continuous spectrum. So we've got a minimum wavelength here, and we have a peak wavelength, and then the intensity falls back down. So we've got this peak wavelength, that looks like the, at this wavelength, you've got the highest intensity being emitted. So let's have a look at some features. We've got short wavelength radiation here, and that's uh, emitted at a low intensity. This longer wavelength is emitted at a higher intensity. Now, strictly speaking, you won't have to do much with these graphs, but they are quite an important part of physics, so that's why I'm including it now. And this is so you appreciate what a continuous spectrum is. A continuous spectrum contains all of these wavelengths, therefore it's continuous. All of these wavelengths from here to here. So that's why it's called continuous, because it's continuous from that point to that point. Uh, this, is, this spectrum is quite typical for a hot object emitting... Uh, infrared, visible light, and ultraviolet light, maybe a little bit of ultraviolet light. So that's a continuous spectrum for like, like a light bulb, possibly a star as well, have uh, that type of a spectrum. 
And the other reason for showing you this is this is different from a line spectrum. So you, you will see some comparisons between continuous spectra and line spectra when we look at quantum physics. Uh, and those line spectra are further evidence of the particle nature of electromagnetic radiation. But that's something for next week. If you look at, if you're able to calculate the area under the whole graph, then that tells you the total energy emitted by the source. Okay, now let's look at the relationship between intensity and amplitude. Now, if we consider a part, a, just a physical particle that's oscillating, this is the distance travelled during one oscillation. It's actually twice this distance because it goes from the peak, goes down to the equilibrium position, down to the trough, and then back up via the equilibrium position. And now if we double the amplitude of that wave, but we keep the frequency the same, so if the frequency is the same, that means it has to complete the full oscillation in the same time, but now the distance is doubled that it has to travel. So this, line, this red line is twice the length the green line, uh, and it's, even though it's doing two of those, it's also doing two of those, so it's travelling twice as far in the same time. So that means that the average speed, it's not travelling at the same speed at each point, uh, but the average speed during the oscillation would have to double in order to enable this to happen, to double the amplitude but keeping the frequency the same. Now, kinetic energy is proportional to speed squared, so that will be quadrupled. The average speed had to double, so the, uh, the, so the average speed doubled, so the kinetic energy must quadruple. So V is proportional to D, that had to double. Kinetic energy is proportional to V squared, so the kinetic energy would be quadrupled. Uh, intensity is proportional to the energy particle, so Intensity was also quadrupled, and therefore intensity is proportional to amplitude squared. Okay. Now we're going to look at polarization, and we'll look at the relationship between this and the intensity also. A plane polarized wave is one where the vibrations are confined to one plane only. Now, only transverse waves can be polarised. The vibrations in longitudinal waves are parallel to the direction that it's travelling. That gives you a one-dimensional overall shape of the wave, and you can't confine that to a two-dimensional plane. So, because we're confining the vibrations to one plane only in polarisation, it's impossible to do that with longitudinal waves, but transverse waves, they can be polarised. So light, yes, that can be polarised because the vibrations in light are perpendicular to that which travels transverse. Sound, you cannot polarise sound because it's longitudinal. And radio waves, yes, they can also be polarised because they are transverse. If you start off with a source of unpolarised light, then the vibrations occur in all planes perpendicular to the direction of travel. So light from light bulbs, light from the sun, that has vibrations in all planes. So then you could then polarise it if you have a polaroid. So let's have a look at a, such a setup. It's called a, called a polarizer and analyzer setup. Polaroids can polarise light. So then we need a couple of polaroids. Here's my two polaroids. This is my polarizer and this is my analyzer. I'm going to take that first polaroid and rotate it from the vertical. So I'm going to rotate it through an angle theta. This one is the polarizer. So now this will polarize it, polarize the light in its plane. It's going to take the unpolarized light and what comes out will have all of its vibrations in the plane of this polaroid here. So here's my unpolarized light. This indicates that the vibrations are happening in many planes which are perpendicular to the direction the wave is travelling. So this, this is the direction the wave is travelling, and these are the vibrations there. Now, 
some of the light will actually be absorbed at this stage, some of the light's energy. So some of it will get through though, and that which gets through has its plane of polarized, is now plane polarized in that same plane as the polaroid, so it's at angle theta from the vertical. Okay, as it is incident on the analyzer, a proportion is going to be absorbed, and a proportion will be, be able to go through the analyzer. But it's going to be repolarized to the vertical plane. So it was polarized at theta to the vertical, but now it's been repolarized to the vertical. Okay, so th this is the analyzer, and that's what it does. It absorbs some of the plane polarized light and re emits it at new plane of polarization. So this here represents the amplitude which was which is incident on my analyzer, and that's at an angle theta from the vertical, that's from the vertical. I'm calling the incident amplitude A0. This A is what passes through the analyzer. So this is the amplitude of the wave as it passes through there, the transmitted amplitude. And then we have this proportion, which was absorbed. Okay? And this proportion here, the transmitted proportion, is equal to A0 cos theta. So you can see the angle theta between those. It's adjacent to the angle, so cos theta multiplied by A0 gives us the transmitted amplitude. And I is proportional to A squared. We just saw that. So I... The intensity, the transmitted intensity, is equal to the incident intensity multiplied by cos squared theta. So that's Malice's law, something you would need to be able to use. And whenever you're dealing with polarization experiments, you should always remember 90 degrees, which is like the magic number for polarization. Uh, if you start with the transmission axes for that, these transmission axes for the polarizer and analyzer parallel, then all of the light that comes out of the polarizer will go through the analyzer, okay, because their transmission axes are lined up. So at zero degrees, everything goes through. And then if we rotate it to 90 degrees, rotate either the analyzer or the polarizer, it doesn't really matter which one, as long as you keep one stationary and rotate the other 90 degrees, then it will, all of the light will be absorbed by the analyzer, so no light will pass through your polaroids. And then if you continued rotating it, it would go back from zero and increase until it reaches um, all of the incident light would go through. So and we can also see that from the equation, either this one or this one, at theta equals zero, cos theta is equal to one, so then a would equal a zero. And at 90, cos 90 is 0, so then A would equal 0. So when they're aligned, when they're parallel, all of the light goes through, all of the polarised light. So it's not all of this light, it's all of this light, the polarised light. That would go through because theta is 1, and then rotate it, and then at that, no light goes through because cos theta is 0. Okay. So 90 is the magic number. Some practical applications for polarization then. Let's remember that 90 degrees is the magic number. Reflected light from non-metallic surfaces is partially polarized. So you can make use of that with polarized sunglasses to reduce glare. If you can align the plane of polarization for your sunglasses, so that it's 90 degrees to this partial polarization here, you can cut out a lot more of the reflected light than just with standard sunglasses. So that can reduce glare, you know, for driving, for cycling, that sort of thing. Uh, so you can you can do that with sunglasses. You can also use this in photography. Now here you could actually get 
couple of different effects. You can either enhance a reflection by aligning the plane of polarization for your polaroid, polaroid filter. So, uh, so the filter is aligned with the plane of polarization of the reflected light, and that will enhance your reflection. And if you rotate it 90 degrees from there so that it's perpendicular to the reflected light, then you'll reduce the reflection. So you could get some interesting photographic effects. So I've been able to use these photographs from a photographer. Uh, this is a pool of water here, and this is a pho the photograph without a polarizing filter. You can see that the light, the reflected light on the top of the water is quite clear, and you can't see past that reflection. But you can reduce that reflection by using the polarizing filter. So this is uh, 90 degrees to the plane of polarization of the uh, reflected light, and that cuts out a lot of the reflection. You can actually see into the water, you can see the bottom of the pool there. So without a polarizer, with it. And here's another one. Here we are enhancing the reflection. So we've got without the polarizer and with the polarizer, and that just makes the reflection a bit clearer, a bit, um, bit uh, more detailed. So here it's a bit vague. You can't really see much detail in the clouds, but here you can see a lot more detail in the clouds. So you've so the same filter has been used to enhance the picture. Okay, so those are a couple of practical applications with light. But then you also have experiments involving radio waves or microwaves. Antennae produce and receive plane polarized waves. So if you, put, if you have a microwave transmitter, it will produce plane polarized microwaves. And the receiver also will only receive plane polarized microwaves. And you have to have the axes transmission and receiving axes aligned, otherwise you'll receive either a weak signal or a zero signal. So you could start off with your transmission axes and receiving axes aligned, and then rotate the receiver 90 degrees and you won't receive a signal, or you could rotate the transmitter 90 degrees and you won't receive a signal, and then you could keep rotating it, and every 90 degree turn it would go from zero to maximum, maximum to zero. Zero to maximum, maximum to zero. Okay, so every 90 degrees that happens. And, uh, so, and you can do the same thing with radio wave waves as well. LCD screens also use polarization. Uh, you, to make the, each pixel, there are three colors, red, green, and blue. Very, very tiny lights and liquid crystal is used to adjust how much light gets through. So you shine plain polarized light through each color, and then adjust the amount of polarization that the liquid crystal provides, because that is a polarized light as well. And you can, you can like shut down the blue and the green lights and have a red pixel, for example. So you have three of those tiny lights making up one pixel, and then each pixel has those, and you can adjust the amount of color in those. Right, enough of polarization, let's move on to reflection and refraction. And uh, here we're going to come across wave fronts. And the wave fronts are when you're looking down on top of a wave and they represent peaks. So here's the direction of my wave, left to right here, and these lines here are my wave fronts. So that's where the peaks of the wave are. Imagine if you're looking down on top of pond and you throw a stone in, then you get these ripples. Those ripples are peaks, and so they're like wave fronts. Halfway between the wave fronts are troughs. So that means that if you take the distance between two adjacent wave fronts, you're measuring between two adjacent peaks, and therefore that's the wavelength. And of course, it's always a good idea just as with the uh, other situation I was showing you of measuring for several wavelengths, it's a good idea to do the same here. So 
measure for like six waves and divide by, measure that total distance, divide by six. So that's always a good, good thing to do. Now, during reflection, waves bounce off surfaces. So let's take a reflective surface here. Here's my incoming wave, which is called the incident ray. So this is a ray, and then perpendicular to the ray are the wave fronts. Now, when we're dealing with these ray diagrams, you always need to define the normal line. So the normal line, using the mathematical term for normal here, that means 90 degrees to the reflective surface. Draw the normal line where the incident ray meets the reflective surface. All angles are measured from the normal line. Okay, so this is the angle of incidence here. And during reflection, the reflected ray is reflected at an angle equal to the incident angle, so that's the reflected angle there, and I is equal to R. That's my reflected ray. Now, if you need to draw the wave fronts, what you do is work out what's happened with your rays, and then you draw some wave fronts at the incident and reflected ray. So there's my incident wave fronts, and there's my reflected ones there. So draw a few there to see what's going on with the wave fronts. And they're 90 degrees, as I said, to the ray. So I've got three represented there, three over there. Okay, now let's look at refraction. This is due to a change of speed of the wave as it crosses from one medium into another, and that often leads to a change in direction as well. So the, oh, the medium of the wave is the substance that it's travelling through. So light can travel through air, and then it may, so outside the room it may be travelling through the air, hits the window and then it's moving through glass, comes back into the room and it's travelling through air again. If it then enters a fish tank, it, and the light enters the glass and then it enters water. So air, glass and water are different types of media. And the density of the medium affects the wave speed. So more dense media will change the wave speed. If you have a, an angle between the incident ray and the, and the normal line as it enters the media, then there's also a change in direction. Okay, so, uh, and there's no need to cover the the equation for this Snell's law in the OCR specification, so I won't actually refer to that here. I'll just go over the general principles for refraction. I have an incident wave coming in here. It's in the air, and it's going to travel, going to cross over into glass. So I've got a glass block here. Now, in this case, the boundary between the air and the glass is what's important. So I've drawn my normal line perpendicular to the boundary at the point where the wave meets that boundary. It's my incident ray and that's my incident angle this time. Remember again, all angles are always measured from the normal line. Okay, so we'll, we'll do the same as before, we'll draw the rays and then we'll work out where the wave fronts are. The, this is for light, so when light travels from air to glass, it slows down and it will refract towards the normal line. And when I say towards the normal line, I mean the refracted angle here is smaller than the incident angle, so it bends towards the normal line. And that's my refracted ray in the glass there. And then I have my incident wave fronts and my refractive wave fronts. I've got three for the incident, three for the refracted, and also note that the refractive wave fronts are closer together there. And so what does refraction affect and what does it not affect? Speed and direction are affected, but the frequency remains constant. So if speed is affected, it's changed, but the frequency is constant, that means the wavelength is also changed. So because my light, my rate of light here slows down and the frequency is constant, that means the wavelength must be smaller to 
make the V equals F lambda equation still match up. So that's why the wave fronts are closer together in the glass block than out here. Okay. So yeah, we've got uh, speed and direction changes, frequency is constant, therefore the wavelength changes. And where the refracted ray exits the glass block, we also have a change of media. So it's going from glass to air. So we have a further case of refraction here. And we will again follow the principles. The ray meets the boundary here, so we'll draw another normal ray. We can't use this normal line because that was for this interaction here. But for this new one, we need a new one. So there's my new normal line. And then it would refract in the opposite direction because it's going from a more dense media to a less dense media. So it will refract away from the normal. Here are what happens in broad terms for refraction with different types of wave. Light, if it travels into a more dense medium, it will refract towards the normal and it slows down. Okay, so the light here slowed down and refracted towards the normal. The opposite is true as well if it went into a less dense medium. A mechanical wave like sound, if that travels into a more dense medium, then it will refract away from the normal, it speeds up. And the opposite is also true for that. And a water wave, if it travels into shallower water, it refracts towards the normal, it slows down. So that's what happens with three different types of wave. And uh, if the incident angle was zero, i.e. it's traveling exactly along a normal line, then there's no change in direction. The r would also be zero for both of those cases but it's still so bad. Okay, so that's reflection and refraction. Now, diffraction. Diffraction is the spreading out of waves as they pass through a gap or pass the corner. Now, if we have a gap like this, because these are my wave fronts, wave is traveling towards this gap. The gap is much larger than the wavelength. So, they'll perhaps be a tiny bit of diffraction, but not very much at all. Uh, also note, I'm also noting the wavelength here. Um, so we get a small amount of diffraction. It's possible that you would get negligible diffraction if, if that difference is really, really big. So I've indicated that there's a tiny bit of diffraction just by curving the edges slightly, and they're getting a little tad longer at the edges of these wave fronts. So not much diffraction. Not much spreading out of the way, just a little bit, but you could even draw all of those the same length. Note that the wave fronts are also still, generally speaking, straight as well, so they're still just a little bit of curvature at the end. And during diffraction, wavelength is not affected, so this distance and this distance, these distances between the wave fronts need to be the same. So wavelength is not changed by diffraction. Now let's change the situation, let's shrink that gap down so that it's equal to the wavelength. So it's equal to the size of the wavelength here. Now what happens is we get a lot of diffraction. So my wave fronts are curved and we've got lots of spreading out of the wave from that gap. And this is when the gap is equal to the wavelength, you get maximum diffraction. So if we just shrank the gap down slightly, you get more diffraction, but it's when you equal the wavelength that you get maximum diffraction. And what this means is that now I could, oh, and the wavelength has still not changed, so bear that in mind. But now I can detect this wave in this re these regions here, which are called the geometric shadow. So the wave was travelling along here, and you would think maybe you couldn't detect the wave over here, but you can. So this is the geometric shadow in the, this region and this region here. So that's what diffraction is. 